lecture, we shall deal with the work of Panini and other grammarians in India and the kind of influence they have had on the development of mathematics. So, in this lecture, I will say something about the development of Vyakarana or Shabda Shastra grammar, something about the centrality of Panini in Indian tradition, some discussion of the nature and purpose of Panini's grammar, few quotes on how modern scholarship has understood Panini Sastradhyayi. We will in particular discuss something about the Shiva Sutras and the kind of techniques that arise from them, the nature of context sensitive rules and other techniques in Ashtadhyayi, something about the idea of zero in Panini and I will say something about uh, Bhattrahari's Vakya Padiya, how it says that uh, Panini's grammar is an upaya. We will explain what it is when it comes. There were many pre Paninian texts. Panini's Ashtadhyayi is not the first grammar of Sanskrit. There were many, many pre Paninian grammarians. Yaskas, Nirukta, we all know there were several Pratishakya texts in various shakas of the Vedas. Panini himself refers to Apishali, Indra, Kashakritsna, Shakatayana, Vyadi, and several others. Panini's Ashtadhyayi, Ashtadhyayi means the text with eight chapters. Sutra Patha, that it is a collection of uh, sutras. There is a, there are two allied texts with the Ashtadhyayi, one is the Dhatu Patha and another is the Gana Patha. Vartika on Panini's uh, Ashtadhyayi was written by Katyayana. Then of course, there comes the very famous uh, Mahabhashya of Patanjali. There were other systems of grammar also in the post Paninian era. Chandra Gomin's Chandra Vyakarana, Sharva Varman's Katantra Vyakarana, Devanandin's Jainendra Vyakarana are some of them. Bhatra is a very famous philosopher. He wrote a very important text, Vakya Padiya. He also wrote a commentary on Mahabhashya. We all know he wrote the three famous Shatakas. Jayaditya in Vamana wrote the first simple commentary on Panini Sashtadhyayi called the Kashika Vritti. This was commented upon by Jinendra Buddhi. Kayata wrote a commentary on Mahabhashya. Dharmakirti is a Buddhist uh, uh, grammarian, he wrote the text Rupa Avatara. Hemachandra was a scholar of several disciplines, he flourished in Gujarat, uh, he wrote grammars of Prakrita languages also. Gopadeva's first Mukda Bodha was a standard text uh, later on in modern North India. A new tradition of grammarians uh, using the tradition called the Prakriya tradition started in 14th, 15th century, Ramachandra's Prakriya Kaumudi. Narayana Bhattatiri, the well known uh, author of Narayaniya, he was a student of the great uh, astronomer uh, Achyuta Pisharati, wrote the Prakriya Sarvasva. Bhattoji's Dikshita's uh, Siddhanta Kaumudi became the standard text which was uh, learnt by students. Panini's grammar was hardly studied in the original format after 17th century. People studied Bhattodi, Bhattoji Siddhanta Kaumudi or several of its simpler version which is what is studied today, Vardarajas, Lagu Siddhanta Kaumudi or Sara Siddhanta Kaumudi. Discussion of uh, philosophy of grammar was equally important in this modern period, Kaunda Bhatta, Vayakarna Bhushana. Then of course, most of you are aware of the great uh, grammarian and philosopher Nagesha Bhatta uh, in 18th century, who wrote several very important texts, uh, the Parama Laghu Manjusha, Paribhasha Hindu Shekara and many, many other important texts. Parallelly, there was an influence on grammars in other languages also. Tamil had Tolkapiyam in very ancient times, then Virasholiyam, Nannul, Kannada had Karnataka Bhasha Bhushana. Shabda Mani Darpana, Karnataka Shabda Anushasana, Telugu had Andhra Shabda Chintamani, Andhra Bhasha Bhushana. Pali Vyakarana is very important from ancient Katyayana's time. There were later grammars like Shabda Lakhana. Prakrita had several grammars. In Akbar's time, there was one Krishna Dasa who wrote a grammar of Persian language uh, called Parasi Prakasha in Paninian methodology using Paninian style and methodology. 
as I explained in the introductory talk also that uh, the Shastras in India do not enunciate a set of propositions or theorems, they explain a set of procedures and these procedures are uh, in different Shastras, they may have different name like Vidhi, Kriya, Prakriya etcetera and the basic texts of various Shastras actually encode these procedures in the form of Sutras. There is a very ancient saying of found in Vishnu Dharmotara Purana of what a sutra is. It just explains the major characteristics of a sutra, Alpaksharam, Asandigdham, Saravat, Vishvatomukham, Astobham, Anavadyancha, Sutram, Sutra Vido, Viduhu, that it has to be concise, unambiguous, pithy, comprehensive, shorn of irrelevances, blemishless, etcetera. It is generally acknowledged that Panini's Ashtadhyayi is the paradigmatic example of such a sutra text. As I explained again in the introductory talk, Panini holds uh, the same kind of position in Indian tradition as uh, Euclid is, uh, Euclid has in the Greco-European tradition. Uh, Now, what is the basic purpose of Panini's grammar, nature and purpose of Panini's grammar? Atha Shabdanu Shasanam is the first Vartika, it is not the first Sutra of Panini, it is the first Vartika of uh, Katyayana. Anushasanam Prakriti Pratyaya Vibhagena Vyutpadanam Tad Vyakaranena Sakshat Kriyata Iti Sakshat Prayojanam. This is Annam Bhatta, the famous author of uh, Tarka Sangraha. He has written a, a Vyakhyana on the Udyota, which is written on the commentary Pradipa, which is a commentary on Mahabhashya of Patanjali, which itself is a commentary. <laughs> Instruction, namely generation of sentences, Vyutpadanam, that is the word Annam Bhatta is saying, by using Prakriti, Pratyaya and other components. So, the words of Sanskrit. Uh, are generated or produced uh, like you have a puzzle sort of a book, you have various basic units, then you sort of make. So, that is the nature of uh, Panini's grammar that you have the basic units Prakriti, Pratyaya and things like that and other components and from that you produce valid utterances, valid Shabdas and uh, that is the nature of Sakshat Prayojanam, that is the direct use of Panini's grammar and the same thing is explained in uh, a different way by Patanjali, who is explaining that uh, what is the ideal way to teach correct sentences, correct words. Of course, the ideal way is to list all of them and uh, then he says that Brahaspati tried to follow this method to instruct Indra and he took uh, 1000 divine years, each divine year is supposed to be 360 years. So, he took 1000 divine years to teach Indra a uh, list all valid uh, word sentences etcetera and he could not reach the end. But of course, that is the ultimate uh, the method that if you really want to say without any doubt that you know the correct utterances, you have to be able to have a list with you, but that is not humanly possible. So, we have to do something, uh, we have to take recourse to a different methodology. Atham tarhi me shabdaha pratipartavya. How are we then going to instruct the valid words and utterances of a language. Kinchit samanya visheshaval lakshanam pravartyam yena alpena yatnena mahato mahataha shabdaugan pratipadyeran. Patanjali's Mahabhashya is said to be the ideal Sanskrit prose. It used to be taught to students till 50, 60 years ago to learn how to learn Sanskrit. <coughs> Kim punastat, what is that method that by a small effort you are able to understand? a large number of uh, correct valid utterances in Sanskrit. That method is Utsarga Apavadav, Kaschit Utsarga Kartavya, Kaschit Apavada Kartavya. So, Utsarga means general rule, Apavada means exceptional rule. So, by a set of general and exceptional rules, we try to approximate and reach all possible valid utterances of the Sanskrit language 
and that is the method that Patanjali is formulating. And remember, right at the formulation of what is grammar, it, the apavada is in fact as important, if not more important than the general rule utsarg. So, of course, uh, he has given Patanjali there is giving uh, two examples of uh, utsarga and apavada, they are fairly technical, karma and yana, tasya visheshena apavada ha, ato nupasarge kaha. These are uh, two sutras uh, which uh, tell you the first one is the general rule where the anpratyaya is to be used, the second one is the kaha to be used. Uh, we will not go into such technicalities. So, we will see an example of a utsarga and apavada while discussing Panini's grammar. <coughs> so, quickly let us see how modern scholarship has understood uh, Panini's grammar, how they have been uh, sort of uh, bewildered and uh, surprised by its uh, depth and detail. So, even as early as 18th century uh, Indologists, uh, these are Jesuit scholars, uh, became aware that Sanskrit grammarians are doing something very different from the grammar texts that were known to them. They are trying to use uh, primitive elements to derive the infinite variety of actual forms in use. Uh, the grammars that are in general use are what are called as paradigmatic grammars. Paradigmatic grammars are where you learn finished forms as it is. We do do that even in Sanskrit today, when we sort of uh, do uh, remember the Rama Shabda. This is a, an example of a paradigmatic uh, instruction. So, you remember Ramaha, Rama, Ramaha, so Akaranta Pulinga Shabda has to go this way. But Panini's grammar is to tell you how to derive Ramaha, Rama, Ramaha, and it will tell you derive all Shabdas and all verbs and all things. So, it is different from the paradigmatic grammars that were generally known uh, in Europe. And uh, Bloomfield is explaining Panini's grammar as the best descriptive grammar of Sanskrit. At the time of Bloomfield in 1930s, descriptive grammar was the technique that the grammarians thought very highly. When this uh, new thing called the generative theory of syntax started in 1964, Chomsky is writing that uh, this tradition in Europe goes back to Humboldt in 1836. And then he also says, Panini's grammar can be interpreted as a fragment of such a generative grammar in essentially the contemporary sense of the term. And Kiparsky, one of the leaders of the generative grammar, grammar tradition in modern times, says that modern linguists acknowledge, uh, modern linguistics acknowledges it as the most complete generative grammar of any language yet written and continues to adopt technical ideas from it. Here is another scholar who is trying to explain that when modern scholarship confronted itself with Panini's grammar, much of it sounded very obtruse and unnecessary and somewhat uh, uh, confusing. And uh, later on, when similar techniques did get developed in Europe, some of them by under the influence of Panini's grammar itself it became very clear that Panini is doing something very interesting, if not very something very sophisticated. So, when uh, similar thing he says happened to the Indian tradition of Navya Nyaya, which people thought was a set of meaningless uh, utterances, till similar techniques became known in Europe and they were then understood to be something philosophically significant. Another very important scholar of Sanskrit is trying to explain how the structure of Panini's grammar is different from all other grammars, that it uses basic elements such as phonemes, roots, group of words, morphemes, and then produce by a set of rules a meaningful sentences. And uh, he also says that uh, in the universal history of sciences, Panini's grammar is the first and foremost example of formalization of technical exposition. And uh, it looks very different from the paradigmatic grammars, but it is something like a set of computer programs or something like that. So, another modern scholar is explaining how uh, generative linguists have marveled at Panini's grammar, mainly because many techniques have been sort of understood uh, based upon it at various times. So, the distinct components of Panini's grammar are the following. The Ashtadhyayi which itself has about 4000 sutras, Shiva sutras, which is a collection of 
phonological or sound segments, dhatu patha, which has about 2000 verbal roots, then gana patha, which is a, a specific list of uh, items, there are 261 such lists. And the grammar is a device that takes you from a certain meaning that you formulate in your mind to the final expression of what you want to state in the form of a, a sequence of sounds. So, we will first look at the Shiva Sutras. These are called Maheshwarani Sutrani. There are 14 of them, Ayun, Rilrik, Aom, Ayauj, etcetera. Mostly classified based upon the way the sounds originate when we speak them. So, each of these formulae has one symbol at the end, which is called the it. So, in ayun this na and in rulruk this k, in aom this na, these are called the it. And uh, these formulas are used to produce subsets of sounds that we need in the grammar. Whenever we want to say these sounds, instead of listing them, we will make a simple formula and bring that list by that formula. So, this technique is known as Pratyahara technique. So, when we say Ak, the first two sutras of Panini, so when we say Ak, we are using I U and drill drill. We omit this in a and omit this. So, the formula ak stands for the five sounds if we say uk it only stands for the three sounds u r, so, by now it should be clear to you the kind of technique Panini is using. Ach will stand for all the vowels A, E, U, R, R, A, O, I, O. Ach is the Pratyahara, these are called. Ach will stand for all vowels. Hal, Haya, Vara, to the last L, that will stand for all the consonants. And of course, you can see that there are these 14 formulae and the last letters are the its, they are to be omitted and mathematically you can form 300 such pratyaharas like ak, ik, ach, hal, etcetera. You can form 300 pratyaharas. Panini in his Ashtadhyayi is using only 42 of them. And uh, this has always been a question, because whenever you discuss Panini, the Indian grammarians also want to prove that he has used the shortest means or the simplest means to do something. And so, the question ha has been asked that, uh, could we have listed these 42 subsets that Panini is using by a different set of Pratyaharas, which is simpler? And this question has been answered uh, that it is not possible, uh, that this is in fact the optimal way of encoding 42 ordered subsets of Sanskrit sounds, these 14 Pratyahara Sutras are the best or the optimal way of doing that. So, as we saw the 4000 Sutras of Panini, there are various kinds of Sutras. There are the Vidhi Sutras, which tell you what is to be done, what a rule for either changing a sound or including a pratyaya in a certain context or that doing something in for some obtaining some meaning. There are Sanya Sutras, which introduce groups of entities or establishes some conventions in use of terms. There are Adhikara Sutras, which are headings that hereafter we will be discussing this and these, these, these points will keep following. One of the techniques used in Panini's grammar is something called Anuvritti that you take the same word in earlier sutras and 
we use them, assume them in the later sutras also. Most important are Paribhasha sutras, they tell you how to interpret and regulate the other rules, they regulate the operation of the other rules. So, let us see some examples of Paribhasha sutras. Shashti Sthane Yoga. The Shashti Vibhakti, when it appears, it will mean in place of. So, if you want to replace one sound by another sound, you use the sound that is to be replaced, you use it in the genitive case. Tasmin iti nirdishte purvasya, locative defines the right context. So, if you want to say before something a certain change has to occur, the later quantity, the later sound is used in the saptami vibhakti, tasmin iti nirdishte. Tasmat iti uttarasya, so something which follows a given sound, an operation is to be done, you indicate it by the panchami vibhakti or the ablative case. The other rule is yatha sankhyam anudesha samanam. If there is a, a set of transformation and two sets of uh, uh, entities are given, you correspondingly take one to the corresponding thing in the other set. That if they have the same number, you just follow a simple rule of one to one corresponding. These are simple Paribhasha Sutras. There are very complex Paribhasha Sutras. In fact, one of the most interesting Paribhasha Sutra of Panini is called the Asiddha rule, <coughs> Purvatra Siddham. This occurs in the, the beginning of the second pada of the eighth adhyaya of Ashtadhyayi. So, this says that all those sutras of Panini, which start with the first adhyaya up to the first pada of the eight adhyayas, are taken to be Asiddha with respect to the later rules. That means the later rules do not exist as far as the earlier rules are concerned. So, the later rules come in a linear sequence, they are called the Tripadi. So, each of them also the same Purvatra Siddham will follow. So, an operation that you do in using a rule of the 8.4 chapter, the, the fourth Pada of the eighth chapter, then you cannot bring in an operation of the second chapter of Panini following that. So, all of them are Asiddha. So, the Paninian grammar as you can see has many, many complex ideas, but uh, we will just examine one kind of rule that is used in Panini just to see the operation of the previous Paribhashas that I had discussed, Shashti, Sthane, Yoga, etcetera. So, a context sensitive rule, what I mean by that is something like this. I have written it like this. It means that if this A is sandwiched between C and D, then it will go to B. This is the nature of the rule. Such a rule is called a context sensitive rule that A goes to B when C is before that and D is after that. Now, in Panini's grammar, such a rule is formulated by on A you put the Shashti Vibhakti and on B you put the Prathama Vibhakti, on C you put the Panchami Vibhakti and on D you put the Saptami Vibhakti and you state your rule, then it means that C is before D is later in that context A goes to B. Let us see this with the well known what is called the Yan Sandhi. Eco energy, ik stands for e u ril r, yan stands for ya va ra la. So, this achi, so ikaha yan achi, this is the, this is in the saptami vibhakti. So, when a vowel follows, this set of ik, which is in the Shashti Vibhakti, this will become yang. So, e plus 
one of the r e plus vowel goes to y r plus vowel. A vowel when it follows e, e will become y. Similarly, u. So let us write it in Sanskrit itself. E will become y. Similarly, for so by the eco energy rule, Panini is doing what is called the Yan Sandhi. So, something a very simple thing let us take Rabi plus Abda. So, here is a E at the end and here is a r which is following. So, it will immediately become ravyabda. e plus r will become y plus r that is ya. This is called the yan sandhi. So, Panini is saying that this yan sandhi is completely characterized by this formula eco energy or by this sutra eco energy. Ikaha sthane achi pare yan syat that if ach follows the ik that will become yan. Now, we also know that ravi plus indra is ravi indra, it is not ravi andra, ravi indra it is not that. So, that is an exception. So, that exception is called the Savarna Dirga Sandhi, Akas Savarne Dirga. This is the Sutra 6.1.101 of Panini that Akaha, Ak, when Savarne, when the same sound follows Dirga, it will become elongated. So, E plus E is equal to E. So, there is eco energy which is an utsarga rule, which is a general rule, which is telling you the yan sandhi and there is an apavada sutra, there is an exception rule agas savarne dirgha, which is giving you the savarna dirgha sandhi. So, this is how rules of Panini are formulated. So, scholars have speculated that one of the important influences of Panini on Indian mathematics could have been the invention of 0 itself. Now, Panini introduces the idea of lopa and even in the first uh, pada of Panini's Ashtadhyayi of the first chapter, the sutra Adarshanam lopa appears. There are about 50 sutras where lopa appears and perhaps this number will be more than 100 if we take into account anuvritti that is taking the earlier word into later sutra. In fact, in the previous example is a case of anu, anuvritti. I, I think noted it. Uh, in eco energy, you take the word samhitayam. Samhita means sounds occurring near to each other. That is when you are doing what is called euphonic combination or sandhi, as we know in Indian languages. So, when ik and uh, achi are there close to each other, samhita, Panini Sutra is paras sannikarsaha samhita, when they are very close to each other that is when these changes occur. So, the word samhita is obtained as anuvritti in understanding the sutra eco energy. This is the kind of way in which sounds are uh, the words come by anuvritti in Panini sutras. Okay. So, the idea is that uh, when some pratyaya or some part of a pratyaya is removed that that is sounding like a 0. because at that point, what is to be done will then be told by another one. So, this is like uh, when we say 
when we want to multiply if this 0 was not there the multiplication will go one way if that 0 were there the multiplication will go another way in fact the transformations in Panini will also be going similarly when the 0 morpheme is there when it is not there. So, that is the way 0 appears as a linguistic element in Panini's Ashtadhyayi. There are also other versions of 0 which are known as look, shlu and loop kind of pratyayas. So, anyway this is a very technical subject and I will not be saying more on that. Is this example clear or is there any doubt on this? Okay. Now, we come to how the Indian philosophers understood the Panini's grammar. As we all know that uh, in barely around 4000 rules or sutras, Panini is able to formulate all rules for formulating correct words in Sanskrit and this he does with the aid, aid of other lists like the Dhatu Pata or the Gana Pata and of course, the Shiva Sutras also. And it was very successful, there is Apaniniya Prayogas were considered wrong, but even then Indian philosophers did think that even such a perfect thing like Panini's grammar is only an approach to language, it is not a substitution for the reality of language itself. In fact, in Patanjali's Mahabhashya, right at the beginning there is a discussion that when we want words, uh, we do not go to a grammarian and ask him or when we want sentences or when he want to when we want to say something, we do not go to a grammarian and say give me a few sentences or give me a few words. Unlike uh, when we want pots or when we want vessels, we go to a metallurgist, a metal worker or a potter uh, to give us uh, pots and vessels. So, a grammarian is working with the language which is already established in the world, the reality of the language lies in the world. The grammarian's task is to give an approach to that reality and therefore, uh, Bhartrahari is here explaining uh, the philosophy of uh, Sanskrit grammarians. This is in fact, the philosophy of most other shastras also in Sanskrit. Bhinnam darshanam ashritya vyavaharo anugamyate tatra yan mukhya mekesham tatra anyesha viparyayaha. Early activities are accomplished on the basis of different theories and philosophies. What is important in one theory may not be so in another. A more commonly known quote of Vakya Padhyaya, Vakya Padhyaya is a, uh, a very big work and a highly philosophical work, uh, very difficult to understand without looking up its commentaries. This verse of Bhartrahari is widely quoted by Indian astronomers also. Bhaskara 1 in his commentary of Aryabhatiya quotes this verse, Nilakantha Somiyaji in his commentary of Aryabhatiya quotes this verse. Upadaya api yehe yaha tan upayan prachakshate upayanan chaniyamo navashyam avatishthate artham kathanchit purushaha kathanchit pratipadyate. The procedures start in the shastras are only means and they are to be discarded even though if the object that we want to accomplish is still there, we have to use them. That is their specific purpose is for accomplishing these objects, they are they have no higher status than that. And to accomplish the objects, the upayas are used and there is no other limitation on them, that there is no other constraint that you put on the methods that are to be used. And in fact, as regards the meaning, most people do know what the meanings are without having to go through the grammarians exercise. Now, the way this verse is understood uh, is from the commentary of Punya Raja, basically it is saying, Kashtida Acharya Panini Virichitena Lakshana Shastrena Shabdana Dhigachati Kashtita Anyanaiti Naniyamaha. So, one teacher may like to teach Sanskrit grammar through Panini's grammar and another teacher may would like to use another system of grammar. If all of them work equally well, there is really no limitation on which is the system to be followed. This is a fairly sophisticated understanding, after you almost come up with a fairly complete theory of uh, uh, 
a mechanism for characterizing all valid words of a sentences of a language. Uh, you also say that this is only a means and if uh, others are coming up with other formulations, uh, which can be equally successful or uh, at least which can, uh, which are of use, you are free to go ahead and use it. This is the kind of philosophical principle that uh, the grammar is only a means for understanding valid utterances. The valid utterances are there out in the world. This is something that is very important even in other sciences when discussing the relation between theory and observation in uh, astronomy this kind of a principle finds a, a more direct use and that is why people uh, have cited this verse of Bhartrahari uh, on the, the, the entire Panini Shastra is an upaya, is a means for understanding. And uh, this was the kind of understanding that Indian grammarians had in uh, setting up their grammatical formulation. Uh, with this, I think uh, we have summarized some of the essential features of uh, Panini's grammar, which are of uh, importance in understanding the development of mathematics in India. Uh, thank you very much. We can have some questions. The Bhattari, I do not know, I have not studied Bhattari to the extent to say whether there is a statement in Vakya Padya saying language is prior to grammar. Uh, but uh, perhaps the Indian understanding is that the world is created along with the Vedas. So, the knowledge of the world and world were created together in some manner. Uh, so, I do not know whether Bhattari would be writing on that kind of an issue in a particular way. But it is true that grammar is an approach to the language. The reality of language is uh, valid in itself and the grammar is only an approach to that reality and that is the kind of principle that he is talking. And the generative grammar serves both the kinds of purposes. One is that given the, uh, that there is a purpose of economy, that uh, you generate all valid utterances from a collection of uh, basic. Uh, so, there are uh, to get all the Shabdas in the our uh, book of Shabdas. So, we have Akaranta, Shabda, Ikaranta, Ukaranta, all these things are there. There are only these 21 Pratyayas, which are applied on the, the Pratipadikas to get all these Vibhakti forms. So, this is an economy, that this is an economy in terms of Prakriti and Pratyaya. You generate all the Shabdas that are there in the Shabda book or all the dhatus, the, the, all the kriya rupas that are there in the book of uh, the, this uh, dhatu uh, rupa books. So, it is a means, it is an economic means and it is a generative method that it is analyzing a given expression in terms of constituents or basic units. Now, this question that these constituent units, what significance they have in themselves in understanding it, these kind of philosophical principles come into play. So, do the meanings reside in these constituent units? Now, if somebody generates another grammar by using different constituent units, then what happens to it? So, to understand all such sophisticated uh, things, these kind of philosophical principles come into play. This is one aspect of generation. The other aspect is that you have a given word, you want to cut it into uh, sort of constituent parts and understand its meaning. That is also a part of generative grammar. So, it does both to a given idea is transformed into a well formed word or sentence. A well formed word or sentence is analyzed to various constituent units, but there is no unique way even though we have a very nice beautiful way given by Panini or other Acharyas for doing it, but it is not to be confused to be the language itself. This is all I think what Bhartrahari seems to be saying. Chapters there are about 4000 sutras. Ashtadhyayi is 8 chapters, each of them has 4, four padas. Work 
No, in the grammar is based upon recursive principles. Uh, so, it is not formulated as a separate uh, principle in grammar that you fo follow one after the other and all aspects of rule ordering etcetera and uh, uh, sort of sequential rule applications, they are all there in the entire Paninian uh, setup. So, recursiveness is a part of the Paninian grammar. Sir, uh, how was the nature of uh, grammar before uh, Paninian's like will the rules uh, be changing in if we take the Vedas and try to uh, this Pratishakyas have rules which are similar to Paninian rules, but they do not encompass whole of uh, uh, both the Vedic language and the classical language that Panini provided in one text. So, they deal with the particular kind of Sandhis and particular kinds of word transformations and they have some rules similar to Panini which texts are pre Paninian, which texts are post Paninian, there may not be complete consensus on that kind of question or clear understanding on it. Uh, so, it is to be understood uh, that uh, Panini is not the originator of all the techniques and all the ideas and all the, he may be originator of many of them, but uh, grammar is much prior to. So, if we have to study some texts before uh, Panini's time, then we will have to study the grammar rules of those times. This is a difficult question, I am not an expert on this, so I cannot tell you offhand. I do not know whether there is even a consensus of this text is prior to Panini and this text is not prior to Panini. Panini is citing various earlier grammarians, but their works are not available. We have Yaskas Virukta, but that is on a some other subject, that is on etymology. And Shakatayana is cited, but we do not have a work of Shakatayana or Apishali. What we have are these Pratishakya texts. And about that, there is no consensus which are earlier, which are later. It is a more complex question. I uh, do not think that uh, we have arrived at good understanding of those questions. Each anima, they have a sound. Each anima, they have some particular sound. You can recognize from the distance. Is there any particular sound for the human beings at the beginning? At the beginning of the, say, evolution, was there any particular sound associated with the human beings? That first question. Second, long ways evolved, grammars followed like that. So the the reason for developing the grammar, as you have already told, to economize our system, knowledge system, or to communicate with her. So the grammar refined the long ways, but how did the long ways Uh, about the first question, I have no answer. I really do not know whether there is some discussion of that question in Indian texts and what do they say about what sounds uh, initially and the nature of the human sound. On the second question that the language evolves and grammar follows, as I said uh, that is implicit in the way even in that example that you do not go to a potter, uh, a, a, a grammarian to ask him for words, it is understood that the language evolves in the world. But now, the changes in language do are reflected in, in new grammatical sort of uh, ideas or principles coming in. Many of the later Indian languages grammars are formulated by that kind of a method only, that uh, there is a original version and then there is a transformed version, what is called the Tatsama and the Tatbhava, uh, that this is the sort of the original version and the later version the word developed into this kind of a form. So, many Indian language grammars are formulated that way. Sanskrit grammars, uh, the things that were left out by Panini or things that were later on changed or occasionally taken note of by various uh, grammarians in Sanskrit. But since Panini gave sort of such a complete and comprehensive formulation, in some sense, that sort of uh, uh, put a 
a structure for the language. Uh, in some sense, the grammar becoming very, very detailed and correct forces the language to evolve more slowly than it would have evolved in, uh, in the natural way when it was not systematized at all. This issue is discussed at great length as to if language is known in the world, what is the use of grammarian? Hmm? Uh, so, uh, that is the what is the grammar for is a very major question which is discussed in the first chapter of Patanjali's Mahabhashya. It is a very detailed philosophical discussion. Ultimately, Patanjali comes to the conclusion that uh, grammar actually tells you what is called the literary or the proper way of uh, using the language uh, and language can still be used in many other ways. So, a grammarian can be identified uh, by knowing that he is immediately using the language in the literally perfect manner. That kind of understanding and so language is still free to evolve the way it evolves. This question is a very complex question uh, and I do not think today's philosophers have fully analyzed what was the nature of this discussion that uh, Patanjali is talking. Music also. Music in what sense? Very similar. That music you find in the world, but musicology is sort of like Yes, yes. There is more music in the world than uh, or the sort of uh, encompassed in the theories of the musicians. Yes. But, uh, after you make a very detailed theory of music, much of the music that you hear in the world is conditioned by the way you have uh, sort of understood your musical principles. I think these are all questions which are very, very uh, fundamental and only people who have sort of first understood the technicalities of this discipline could then go into such philosophical issues. In fact, the Indian texts uh, almost emphasize first that you understand the details of the techniques. The philosophical questions can come later, because there is no unique single answers to these philosophy, uh, I mean the kind of question that started off Chomsky, that whether the nature of grammar, there is some universal grammar that is there in the mind, already in the mind of every individual. Uh, and from that he ultimately arrives at the need for formulating a generative grammar. I think the Indian uh, grammarians and philosophers go the other way around. You first formulate a fairly sophisticated and uh, uh, a grammar that works. Then maybe some philosophical questions uh, can be addressed because otherwise there is no simple access to those kinds of questions, and many of them perhaps have to be left unanswered for generations or for all times to come. <laughs> so, 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 this is a, he's talking about mathematics. Yes. So, one is the, the essential algorithmic structure of Panini's grammar, a set of rules which are operated on a set of symbols and these rules are sequenced and uh, intermingled and uh, ordering of these rules and the nature of the output and conditioning of everything. So, this entire scheme is, uh, uh, is what Panini gives and all the mathematical algorithms are sort of much simpler compared to the very, very large corpus of very sophisticated rules that uh, Panini is dealing with. But of course, mathematicians are dealing with a different context. You have to find an algorithm for solving a particular problem and so you are constrained by sort of what that problem gives. So, this uh, recursion, this algorithmic nature, using of this symbolic languages which is at the basis of algebra, uh, even this partially ordered subsets that we are constructing by the Shiva Sutras. So, many, many ideas are there which are uh, of a deep mathematical significance, whether in our mathematical tradition we did develop all of them or to what extent we have considered them may be a question, but uh, surely all these have had a great impact on the development of mathematics in India. And as I said, zero is one of the issues where most scholars believe. Yes, yes. 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 helped in creating the algorithm. We can ah, say he, he is dealing with very sophisticated algorithms already and so in mathematics you can formulate fairly. It is the so, symbolic thing. language, uh -huh. recursive nature of the rules, rules and algorithmic formulation 
and uh, many I mean these are the kinds of things which we can already say and 0. I think the, there is some understanding even the plus value system uh, in some sense is based upon certain grammatical principles. So, uh, like this there are various things in my short lecture and due to my limitation of knowledge I could not go through all aspects. These are the gist of things we learned from the detective. Yes, yes. So, thank you.